I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2022. On the Radar this week, we're exploring impossible beauty standards and checking in on body positivity with our guests, Gloria Lucas from Nalgona Positivity Pride and Savage Fenty models, Stephen G and Alexa J. Contributor Catalina Eccleston talks about BBLs and Mario Ramil has a scoop on beauty for men. It's been a month since New Year's and if you haven't already broken your resolution, then you're probably among the slew of Americans who didn't make one at all. A lot of us are still processing 2020. But for those of you who still have goals, good on ya. Topping the list of New Year's resolutions in 2022, yet again, is lobbying to ban offshore drilling. I'm kidding, it's losing weight. And given the US weight loss market is now worth a record $72 billion, it's safe to say that keeping Americans buying into the delusion that the latest fad diet or meal plan or Peloton is the way to stay trim and Emily in Paris thin is lucrative. Today I want to talk to you about beauty standards. It's a layered topic and its demands can be extremely costly. I think it's pretty safe to say that across most Western cultures there's an obsession with watching a cinturita. It should come as no surprise since the diet industry is known for its abusive ad targeting. And as activated by COVID, it's making its comeback with a vengeance, looking to make back every single dollar that it missed out on. Between diets, gym memberships, and plastic surgery, there's an industry-supported social pressure to stay flaca. It's important to remember that arriving at a thin body doesn't necessarily mean being happy or healthy. From the diet market to the beauty industry, corporations prey on our deepest insecurities. And given they've convinced us to buy many rolling pins made of stone to detoxify our faces, we can safely assume they've been highly effective. But the so-called ideal look or body type that weight loss companies, fashion brands, and certain social media apps like to promote are in stark contrast to reality. Not to mention manipulative and often toxic. I think that the wellness industry the weight loss industry and beauty, you know, are all combined. There has been some important changes that have taken place, you know, including more dark skinned people, people of different sizes and abilities. But at the same time, you know, there's been some co-opting in which marketing takes place within a feminist body positive lens without making those crucial changes. And what I see more now is the smaller businesses starting by women of color, by Black women, by Indigenous women who are addressing the needs and being more transparent about, you know, um, just creating more ethical products and having a more ethical marketing as well. The number of dieters in the U.S. has actually fallen, due in part to the body positivity movement. It used to be body positivity was, you know, feeling your best and doing your best to feel your best. But now I really see it as um, just, it doesn't really matter what's on the outside. I think body positivity is really how you feel on the inside about yourself and how that transfers over to your outer appearance or aura. I feel like the most confident I've ever been and the most positive I've felt about my body has been when I'm my biggest, but I, you know, truly love myself and I nourish myself and take care of myself in a way that, you know, makes me appreciate my body. I think that um, there's a, a mold in society and media that we have to break um, as, as being the stereotypical beauty standard. For fashion, it was always, you know, very thin or for men very muscular still a hard thing to break because that's what a lot of society is conditioned to um but a lot of that is changing now i think that there are a lot of great women um in the industry who have pioneered they've been able to make a lot of strides a lot of men of course may vocalize beauty standards for women but when it comes to progression in fashion uh women have definitely surpassed that even if it is commercialized um, getting the right people in place, they're able to vocalize for a lot of people who don't have a voice. And so I think that when you look at it from that standpoint, it's more of an opportunity um, just to raise awareness and just to also bridge the gap of, of what health is and what beauty is. Health isn't defined by size. So anytime that you're able to advocate for that as a curve or a broad uh, model or just person in general, 
um, that's a great opportunity. I feel that the body positive movement was a great introduction for a lot of us, including myself. And the issue with it is that it stopped evolving. I feel that body positivity, it's kind of like the surface level. And when we're tackling bigger industries, such as the weight loss industry, the body positivity wants to stay with the cupcakes and a chubby person and call it a day and check out. But it's like, no, we got to look at these deeper ingrained issues that are all around us. We have to address the whole cake, not just the slice. Beauty standards in the U.S. have a tendency to uh fluctuate. The 50s were all about the Maryland hourglass. In the 60s, Twiggy's slender stature was iconic. Late 80s and early 90s shifted toward an emaciated and drug-addicted vibe known as heroin chic. And in 2014, Vogue famously proclaimed the era of the big booty, blatantly overlooking Sir Mix-a-Lot's attempt to idealize it back in 92. Despite the shift to embrace curves, not all real women have them. Not naturally, anyway. And so the 2010s gave rise to the BBL, a body type for those who want an itty bitty waist and also a round thing in your face. Beauty standards vary from culture to culture. And in Latinidad, contrary to popular belief, hay varias culturas. Some defining factors are class, race, and skin color. El tumbao para lo que sabe. And how they're used is defined largely by where you're located. In Brazil, for example, where gradients of race and skin color vary widely, Black curves have become highly sought after. And the country's collective desire to celebrate los bumpies, las chapas, que vibran, has influenced other countries to do the same, giving rise to the Brazilian butt lift, or the BBL. Now, I wouldn't be me if I didn't pause for a second to ponder on this evolution of beauty. From what seems like one moment to the next, the standard of beauty has went from anything black to everything black. Es curiosa, no? Now, for keeping it real, black aesthetics are more accepted than actual black people. Whether the phenomenon is attributed to a rise in multicultural acceptance is still up for debate. The one thing we know for sure is that the procedure is amongst the most dangerous, but that's not stopping women from taking on the risk. And because the surgery is dangerous, it is also expensive. And hordes of women are flocking to unlicensed physicians in the United States and in Latin America to get it done on the cheap, risking pretty much everything. Now, although these procedures have the power to increase your social currency, thank God, they're expensive. And if it's for you, great. Just know that you have options to avoid botched or fatal surgeries by doing your homework and making sure that these doctors are board certified and are licensed. Haz tu tarea, mi gente. And if it's not for you, that's also great. The point is to abide by what you're comfortable with and to align yourself with your standard of beauty. The stigma around getting work done has definitely waned, although there seems to be no line gossip calmness will cross when it comes to dissecting the perceived imperfections of celebrities' botched surgeries. Also, there's a special place in hell for whoever came up with the celebrity cellulite beat. Spoiler, we all have it. But one thing the increasing demand for cosmetic surgery has revealed is that Eurocentric features are still the main metric for beauty, with rhinoplasty and blepharoplasty being by far the most popular procedures. I think white supremacy and colonialism absolutely shape how people all over the world um, think about what is beautiful and, and what they consider beautiful. Some of the early racial theorists who were kind of these white European men who were figuring out, like analyzing what they thought the differences between races were um, and listing characteristics. And obviously this is all based um, in racism and not based on any sort of factual evidence. Um, but one of the things they, they spent a lot of time thinking and writing about was what race is the most beautiful? Um, and it will be no surprise that among all of these categories, white people were considered the best, the most beautiful, the smartest, all of these things. When we look at beauty standards across the social construct of gender, the pressure to conform is not exclusive to women. Honestly, between you and I, I'm a little embarrassed because I've never done this online dating stuff, but I'm glad we matched. You're, um, you're honestly a, a hunk. <laughs> <laughs> What's your zodiac? Um, a, a Capricorn. Mm. We gotta work on that. On my zodiac. 
No, silly. Your eyebrows. Oh. I'm going to take you to trim those edges. Oh. oh, okay, all right, well, how much time do you spend? Do I take hours? I mean, you can't look this camera ready <laughs> in just a few minutes or anything. Yeah. The thing is, my best friend's cousin is neighbors with Mario Lopez. He gave us a few trimming tips and how to make your eyebrows more symmetrical to your nose and your mouth. And uh, yeah, really the trick is you gotta go full Scorsese for a while. And then you wanna micro them and wax them every three to four days. You wax. No, I hate hair. I love it up top, not so much down below. Yeah, I feel like it just doesn't let the moisturizer really penetrate the pores. I use uh, several miracle creams uh, on my body and my face, but I particularly love this one that I buy off the black market from a little town in Uruguay called Mirda de Mono. It translates to Miracle of the Mountain. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But do you want appetizers? Can we? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm actually on a diet. Yeah, I only kangaroo milk for this guy. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna go escape to the bathroom. It was nice meeting you. I'm sure it was. Damn, you were you were getting ripped, my guy. As society normalizes men being snatched without diminishing their masculinity, cosmetic procedures for dudes are on the rise. Being a queer male like myself, you know, uh, living and existing in LA and in uh, the West Hollywood space, like the, the boys like to work out, the boys like to look pretty, the boys like to, you know, keep it cute. And the stress and anxiety so many people have to live up to that it's very daunting, overwhelming sometimes. So I think that that's kind of led to so many men specifically looking to plastic surgery. I think that it really goes to the question of who are we individually and what do we find beautiful about ourselves? And I think that that's kind of where things have gotten off track, I feel. This belief that yes, you can have a skinny nose, but juicy lips and bigger hips and all these things. And I think it just really comes down to really appreciating all of our beauty together. I think that we really need to look inward and really find what feeds us authentically as opposed to giving into this pressure to be like, look like a certain person. I think the gender expression is crucial uh, really to being your authentic self. And for me, for instance, a lot of the clothes I wear are for plus size women, but when I wear it, I feel confident. I feel beautiful. I feel like I am in fashion, you know? Don't worry about what someone may think or one individual who's coming to you from a place of ignorance as opposed to someone who will see that beauty shine through. My website, verygoodlight.com, launched in 2016, and it was a beauty website all about redefining masculinity. I mean, for me as an Asian American person who didn't fit the stereotypical masculine identity of this country, I've always questioned and wanted to explore what masculinity meant. I always knew that I wanted to start a gender inclusive beauty brand because it was so jarring looking at the beauty aisle, seeing that, you know, there are hyper feminine products in one section, hyper masculine products in another. Where was the average consumer like me? I love the skin positivity movement. I think that skin should look like your skin. When it comes to body modifications or, you know, facial modifications, I think that it's okay as long as you want to look like a more enhanced version of yourself. I think that's healthy to a certain point. When when it gets unhealthy is when you want to completely change who you are. Where I'm not okay with that is when you go overboard and you just want to alter yourself completely. Understanding beauty regimens across cultures requires an understanding of sociology, history, and sometimes whatever is trending on Instagram. In the Latinx community, in addition to aesthetic preferences, colorism has historically influenced class distinctions and cultural expressions, and clearly it's still a factor for the British royals who question what skin tone Meghan and Harry's baby might have, leading to the second most famous global departure, Megxit. I think as 
a, as an industry that's trying to make money, it's very much in their interest to sell products to the broadest range of people possible. So they want people from every race and every background to feel like, oh, this product can be for you. This can help you um, look more beautiful. But they also know that <laughs> When people are looking around and understanding what is considered beautiful, that's often whiteness and white features and, and white markers of beauty. And so I think in many ways they're capitalizing on that and saying, you may not be white, you may not be this thing or this other thing that's considered beautiful, but with our products, if you buy it, you can help look more that way. Um, so I, I think they're, they're very much connected. And across the Asian continent, colorism dominated by white Western standards of beauty permeate the culture, from whitening creams to face kini, which, by the way, are terrifying and should be relegated exclusively to horror films. Historically, because of white supremacy and because of this idea that stemmed from the 1700s and 1800s of colonization, a lot of European countries oppressed different cultures throughout the world, from South America to Africa to the Americas. They changed the culture and broke these systems that existed. And in turn, they really put this oppressive lens of what beauty was defined by. That's fair skin, or perhaps eyes that look like a certain way, or, you know, certain cheekbone features. Of all the beauty categories, the skincare market is the mothership. And one country has an outsized role in the rapidly growing multi-billion dollar industry. South Korea, where K-beauty is just as influential as K-pop. And if you combine K-beauty standards with our obsession with filters or Facetune, it might explain the rise of the skin positivity movement, which serves to remind us that skin has texture and pimples and wrinkles and pores, right? South Korea is now the epicenter of beauty. This is where all the technology comes from. It is light years ahead of all other countries. And I think it has a lot to do with South Korea having a lot of uh, French manufacturers in the country that left the country in the 80s and 90s. And then South Korea was like, okay, we have all these French manufacturing facilities. Let's utilize it and let's really push this industry forward. People are looking at South Korean actors and K-pop stars and asking, how do they get their skin so dewy? All manufacturers from Estee Lauder to L'Oreal to everything in your beauty closet is probably manufactured in South Korea. Attitudes around inclusivity in the beauty industry are changing. I mean, there's a reason TikTokers have been giving America's Next Top Model some serious side eye. It hasn't aged well, and that's not a commentary on the models. On the other hand, brands like Rihanna's Savage Fenty are proving that inclusivity isn't a trend, but just good business. You see brands that were really the front runners in being inclusive because they knew it was right. Brands like Savage X Fenty, like they, from the jump, made sure to not just include plus size models, but able-bodied people, disabled-bodied people, pregnant people, all different genders. Inclusivity was really a must for them. And now you're seeing a lot of companies, you know, transfer over into this all-inclusive mindset but they're not doing it correctly. I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've felt tokenized in photo shoots, being the only person of color and the only plus size person, kind of like a kill two birds with one stone situation. And I feel like that's just not genuine at all. And especially when the products don't reflect that either. Um, a lot of companies are, you know, fast fashion, just putting things out to make money rather than to make their customers feel beautiful and making products that actually work for plus size people. But I think people like myself and other creators or models that speak up on it and are honest about it is the only way that we're gonna get change and really get this message and meaning across so there is real improvements in the industry. The most fulfilling moment is just working with the Savage X Fenty brand, Rihanna's brand, and getting that opportunity to to model for them. And then uh, it actually being my first shoot as a signed model. So for it to go viral, another one is when I was able to travel to Germany, first time in Europe, um, working with Heimer, a brand out there. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The team was great. As a creative director, I worked with a lot of local brands, so a lot of streetwear brands um, locally here in Kansas City. I want to uh, really give a platform for um, creatives that are not the norm, not the expected. Uh, really give them an opportunity to showcase 
um, their artistic genius. We all want to look good and feel good about ourselves, which is the great irony of subscribing to institutions, apps, or archaic standards that have statistically been proven to make us feel worse. Achieving the ideal standard of beauty is layered. It is a goal that can be extremely costly, whether in the form of actual money or at the expense of our mental health with things like body dysmorphia, and in some cases, even that. So on the flip side to all of this, there's an uptick in sales in beauty products because more and more women of color are buying into a standard of beauty that best represents themselves. Mm, we love to see it. <laughs> and as beauty trends evolve, know that it's okay to explore your options. Just make sure that the path that you choose is healthy and best celebrates who you are. Porque eres el final.